And just on behalf of the Translation Studies uh, Network of Ireland, uh, I want to welcome everybody to this, uh, our first annual conference uh, of the TSNI, which somebody said sounds suspiciously like the auxiliary branch of the police service in Northern Ireland, <laughs> uh, but uh, hopefully we won't be indulging too much in prescriptive approaches uh, to translation today. Um, the Trinity Centre for Literary and Cultural Translation is uh, <laughs> delighted to, to host uh, this event. Uh, I think it shows how far translation studies have developed uh, in Ireland uh, over the last uh, 30 years, because I can still uh, remember uh, gathering people in the late 80s um, who were interested in uh, translation studies, uh, and there probably isn't a room small enough in this building to house a number of people at some of those early meetings. So to see such a magnificent is, I think, uh, proof of just how much uh, translation studies has developed and uh, evolved on the island. And I, I think translation, both as a uh, metaphor and as a practice, uh, speaks to uh, a changing uh, island and a changing uh, world, both in terms of the context uh, between languages and cultures, but also in terms of the kind of the human machine uh, interface, which is uh, changing uh, our present and future in all kinds of different ways. Ernoi is there will gine on Ashtakon, a dealer fanu on the Gamfish in Asian, Agus Nivadum's Dolion, a Gomi, Machnev Yena Er Junkers, Agus Er Unkus, on Ashla, a Sopo Hef Shaw, Agus Muit a Gratno, Er Hevris Agus Er Ritner, a tradition Orsa on Ashtakon in Asian, a Stolen. More than that, there are more course. Lesson Glachus Mar Aris Marcharis Fasa Mar Oscars Insna. I would like to take uh, this opportunity um, to um, dedicate, in a sense, this conference uh, to one of our great uh, translators, uh, the Belfast translator Kieran Carson, uh, who passed away uh, recently. Uh, the translator of Handel. Uh, translator of Dante, uh, the superlative translator of the poem of Ulnia. And it seemed to me that uh, Chiron, in his generosity, uh, his openness, uh, the way in which he navigated between the, uh, the languages uh, of this uh, island, was exemplary in his commitment um, to the uh, art of uh, translation. Um, Marshin, Guim Gach Ida, Er Ober, Agus Er Ler Swingle on Lay. I hope this will be a fruitful and enjoyable day for both speakers uh, and, and that the uh, translation of Ireland, uh, to paraphrase uh, Shakespeare, will be full of noises, uh, sounds, and sweet airs that give delight and hurt uh, not. Um, it is now my very pleasant uh, duty. Uh, to uh, introduce uh, our uh, guest speaker this morning, uh, Carol O'Sullivan. Um, of course, Carol O'Sullivan is uh, returning to her uh, alma mater uh, here this morning at uh, Trinity College, where she studied uh, Italian and uh, French uh, and was one of those embarrassingly gifted and brilliant uh, students uh, that uh, outstripped any superlative that could be uh, thrown in her direction. Uh, and she went on to do a PhD in the University uh, of uh, Cambridge uh, on the translations of and by Raymond Gullo, uh, Samuel Beckett, and uh, James Joyce. Um, to teaching at the University of Anglia and Portsmouth, uh, she moved to Bristol in, in the summer of 2013, where she is now a senior lecturer in translation uh, studies. Um, she is editor in chief. Of uh, one of the foremost uh, translation journals on the planet, uh, translation uh, studies. Um, and she is um, the author of many uh, works uh, concerned with or devoted to the subject of uh, cinema and uh, translation. Um, just two I can mention translating popular film, uh, which is uh, a must uh, read, uh, came out in 2011. And uh, very recently, uh, Carl co edited uh, with Jean-François Cornuche 
uh, the translation of films uh, 1900 to uh, 1950. Um, so without further ado, I proud to invite you to the Thank you. Thank you. Um, and also turn off my email, otherwise it's going to ping happily every 30 seconds throughout this lecture. Let me just turn off the phone, and apologies for it. Is it working? Has I broken it already? No? Okay. Awesome. Um, okay. So first of all, I'd like to say um, I'd like to congratulate um, the TSNI on its on its inception. I've been following, as I, as um, Michael said, I grew up here, and I've been following translation studies in Ireland. I've been to a number of wonderful conferences, including conferences here in Trinity, and um, and it's it's a brilliant initiative, and I, I, I wish it very well. And I was very very honoured indeed to be asked to come and talk at the beginning of it, um, and and still am. Oh. Okay. Was I suddenly more audible there? Okay, I'm going to have to keep an eye on that. So, um, can, James, can you let me know if I, if anything needs to be fixed on the text? So this is, some of you who have heard me speak before have probably heard me mention some of these things. I've been engaged in a very, very long, slow piece of research, um, which started with the question, when was the first film subtitled in English? Who did it? Why? Where? And so on, and, and which film, and, and 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 from that has come this project, which is a book project in process as well, which will be a history of subtitling in the English-speaking world. And of course, talking about subtitling in the English-speaking world is very problematic. And one of the things, one of the problems that immediately raised its head was, um, where do I fit Ireland in that panorama of the English-speaking world? And so, what I want to talk to talk about is. Um, subtitling in in Ireland in the mid 20th century. Now, there's a lot of literature out there on audiovisual translation between Irish and English, notably by scholars like Ethan O'Connell, and um, a lot of it is based around the launch of TLG and what was happening then with with policy and with Irish media policy in the last 20 25 years. Um, so I'm going to go back a bit further. Um, and I'm going to start off by just giving a little orientation to some of the questions that have been structured in this research. And then I really want to just like show you a whole bunch of primary material um, that we can look at to see how people um, wished for and experimented with and failed with subtitles in Ireland in the mid 20th century. So, so this is actually 11 reasons. I'm sorry, I've got 11 reasons. Um, uh, and so I've added one. But, the reasons why we might do this project. So audiovisual translation is obviously an incredibly hot topic. You know, the media media translation is exploding and it's diversifying, and the accessibility agenda has brought huge perspectives to the topic. Why sit in the 1930s, as I've been doing for the last five years, um, looking for films which probably don't exist anymore, um, and some of which probably definitely don't exist anymore. So first of all, because there's such a thing as open research, and we should feel free to ask any research question if you want. And so one of my questions is, you know, what happened uh, 80 years ago? Um, also, because I think one of the things that's been great about this research is talking to audiovisual translation practitioners who have expressed intense interest in learning about their own industry and their own craft as it began, in, you know, in, in terms of historicizing the practice. What are we doing today, and how is that different from what we were doing? 80 years ago. And in this, something that's been very interesting and salutary is there's such a long tradition, represented by several very notable people in this room, of talking about literary translation and the history of literary translation. And we take into it, we, we take for granted that if we go to a library like the library just across the way there, there will be copies of these translations that we can consult. People keep books, they don't tend to keep films. And anybody in this room, Who's ever thrown out a VHS cassette? And I'm not asking anybody to admit anything. But you know, we don't keep films. Films are ephemeral, and audiovisual translations are ephemeral in a way which I think is actually <coughs> losing us a huge part of translation history. 
So one of the things I do if I go around talking about this topic is to say to people, think again about some of the things in the attic. Um, there might be texts there that, that in 10 years' time, or in 5 years' time, or in 50 years' time, somebody would love to study. So I also wanted to quote here the great translation story of Eden Dust. So the, the purpose of writing a history of translation is to reconstruct, re reconstitute the modalities of cultural transfer within which translations proper take place and acquire meaning. So, and we know this as well from the language industries. There's, there's a language transfer operation which is increasingly equated with what translations do, especially in, perhaps in the age of machine translation. And we know that translators do all sorts of other things. So how do we bring these things together? And the DOS does it through linking these ideas of, of, of transfer and of translation. Some of the reasons why we would do this, this historical research are the reasons why we do any historical research to interrogate narratives that maybe need taking a second look at, to bring insights from the past to bear on current challenges, to look at agents and the tools of translation in the tradition in which Anthony Pym, Andrew Chesterman, um, and many other um, scholars have been doing, to understand the development of the profession. And I note that we're very short on research into history of the translation professions. So there's a lot of work on the current translation profession, there's a lot of work on translation history, it's not necessarily meeting. Also then, it's an interdisciplinary conversation between history and media studies, film and media studies, and translation studies. What are the insights that we can bring to bear on each other's disciplines? So we want to share insights from media history where much of the, the interesting work on translation has been done, and also in turn to influence the conversations that are happening. We need to identify what primary material survives, and we need to know what you would like to survive, what's out there to find. So these are just some of the things that have been structuring this research. I just need to keep an eye on, on the time for myself. Oh dear. Okay, so um, I'm going to, we might, we might come back to the question of who all of this is for um, at, the, at the end of this, at the end of the session. Um, and we might also come back to some of these questions of how we historicize things like text on screen, which you know, is something which is a recursive thing. Practices which we're thinking of as highly innovative now were highly innovative in 1931. So maybe that's something to, that we can, can think about. This is Niemann's left. We look at the way that a title might move on the screen in relation to what characters do. And again, so those of you who recognize the shots from Slumdog Millionaire and John Wick 2, or John Wick, I can't remember, um, will um, we'll see the, the sort of parallels. Um, I also just want to mention, in terms of historicizing ABT practices, that this, this, so this research takes place in a cadre of thinking about retranslation. So the two, the two films I'm going to talk about, which were subtitled in the early in the mid 20th century, are films that I've been looking at different versions of and looking at their evolution in translation. This is a particularly striking example because it's from the early period of sound film. So if we look at the surviving, a fairly battered copy of the surviving version of Reading Cows and Lenica Fit in 1933 in the US, in the 70s. In 1981, on the BBC, it had 230. In 2002, Lenny Borger did new subtitles for Criterion, another 433. And I have a pirate copy that somebody slipped me um, that has 500 that I still have to work out a provenance for. But what we see is this idea that what a subtitled film is and what viewers want changes over time. And the basic narrative is that when subtitles came in, subtitles weren't sure what people could take in the way of the amount of text, which is funny because silent films had hundreds of titles. I mean, they were very text -filled. And yet this, this massive media transition where instead of the, the text alternating with the moving footage, you suddenly have the text on the moving footage, and then everybody gets very cautious about what is cognitively possible for the viewer. So then we also think about, you know, what's happening with the viewer's cognition over time? Are we getting better at reading subtitles? Are, are our expectations different? So we're going to talk a little bit about the expectations in, or they might not have been met in the very exciting session. So, okay, I'm going to actually, you know what, I'm going to go straight to the main event and I might come back to a couple of the, um, uh, of the other um, previous slides. So, 
a lot of this project is to set up a dialogue, an interdisciplinary dialogue. There are many people in this room, I, I, I'm pretty confident, who are doing interdisciplinary research, and you will know how difficult it is to set up and maintain a dialogue where uh, people's background literature and priorities are very different, even within the arts and humanities. So some of the things that this research can contribute to include new readings of canonical films, forgotten episodes in media history, the reassessment of the importance of technical roles, and in many ways, subtitling was a technical role in the film industry, rather than a language role in the language industry, and as part of this dialogue between disciplines. So I want to start by setting the scene. So who started talking about writing in Ireland, in Irish? or the subtitling of Irish language material. And of course, the film history of Ireland is one of late development in lots of ways, that there were lots of people filming in Ireland, but an actual Irish film industry seen in those fairly, what we'll see are fairly narrow national, nationalist terms, and took quite a long time to develop. But there was a lot being said about what should be out there from an early stage. So I understand there are silent films with English and Irish titles. I don't know how many of them survive. Um, but I'm going to start in 1940 with a uh, Jesuit priest, and of course that's another factor in the re religion that features strongly in, in this history, because the church was so involved in thinking about media policy. Um, so uh, R.S. Uh, Devan, I want to say Devan, not Devan, Devan, um, who says that uh, in, in a long, he, he wrote a, an awful lot for British and Irish newspapers, about what film culture should be in Ireland. And one of his ideas is that um, so tourism is going to be a major um, element of that. Short films with simple Gaelic commentary would be produced for use in schools under the, direct, under the direction of the educational authorities, or imported films would be subtitled in Gaelic. So there, there's two things, and one is what you do with Irish language filmmaking in a country where many people don't speak it, and um, one is how do you how do you take advantage of this fast-growing entertainment industry? And of course, film is a huge and popular leisure activity in Ireland to, 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 to make it educational. So um, uh, we want to, uh, I'm hopping forward to 1943. This is an, a letter in the Dublin Evening Mail to uh, um, uh, Captain Mulhall, um, who says, we have hard, had evidence in the cases of foreign films like Meyerling and La Femme du Boulanger that the language used in the soundtrack didn't keep people from enjoying good films. I suggest that advantage be taken of this fact and that all soundtracks be in Irish with printed English captions. So he's talking about dubbing that's happening in Europe and saying, well, if in Hollywood they're producing French, German, well, they were in Hollywood, French, German, Italian, Spanish versions are going to be produced, why not also produce an Irish version? Almost everyone under 30, so we remember we're in 1943, almost everyone under 30 would understand the soundtrack and those who didn't know Irish could still enjoy and follow the film with the aid of the English captions. And if the latter were regular film goers, they would soon pick up Irish. So this letter appears just above another letter by the film historian and um, um, enormously important figure in Irish um, cinema history, Liam O'Leary, who has a slightly different view. So there's a film come out called A Row on Leomora, and it's come out in two versions, and it's been sold free to cinemas to show and he says, uh, Liam says, it's an excellent start, deserves the solid support of all people who believe that we Irish can revive our language. The film itself, in any case, demands attention. The distributor of the film informs me, however, that of 250 cinemas circularized, only four have asked for it, and many show no interest at all in either version of the film. It should be noted this film is being distributed for free, so even when they were giving it away, they couldn't get people to take it. All this points to something radically wrong. And so the, when we look at what's happening, the response to subtitled films, as I'm going to show, we see some of where that radical wrongness sits. So this is, I mean, this is already known, this is already part of the history of the Irish language in Ireland, on which I should say I'm completely unqualified to pronounce. So um, I'm very open and welcoming of corrections to any of the uh, inferences I might be drawing from this material. So the first of the films I want to look at um, is Rome Open City, um, a film <coughs> that I have talked about before, a film of which I have eight versions, subtitle versions, two of which 
I don't have Sweden. I have six. And the two, the original British release of the film by London Films, and the Irish release I'm about to talk to you about, to talk about just in case anybody gets excited, I don't have them. I cannot show them to you, um, but I would like as many as people as possible to know about them, so that if there are fragments surviving anywhere someday, they might find them. So Rome Open City um, opened in November 1947 with the legal rooms in Dublin with Irish and English subtitles. And this bilingual subtitling was an initiative of a British distributor, interestingly enough, who was Alexander Corda and Dennis Cunningham of London Films. And there had been a big press release earlier in the year. There had been a, 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 a trip to Dublin by Cunningham, who met De Valera and said, isn't this great? We're now going to have Irish subtitles of all foreign films in Ireland. And next up is Les Enfants du Paradis. And um, then, uh, then, so what we can, what, what we have available is that we can look at the press data that we have about the release of this film, and also some more sort of archival data that I found here at Trinity Museum. So the film had been released in America. So Open City is the same type of category used for the American release. And the first Sally in the press that I found is a, somebody called. Um, uh, it was with amazement that I saw in your widely read paper the news item that the film Open City is to be presented in Dublin with both Irish and English subtitles, as many people will understand the Irish as will understand the Italian. It is a peculiarly inappropriate time to make this futile gesture of respect to the language when the Gaelic enthusiasm of the Abbey Theatre directors has been shown only to result in a journey. Um, we interested to extend this provision of Irish in steps modern in Not for the first, not for the only time. Judging by his letter in Saturday's Mail, your correspondent Saxon must have very little trouble. What earthly harm does it do him if the subtitles of the film Open City are in Irish as well as in English? If you object so much to the language, no one is compelling him to read the Irish subtitles, which is not entirely true because it's hard to avoid subtitles when they're on the screen. But as a matter of fact, they are in a much more subdued print than the English ones, so they do not confuse the audience or distract attention from the film. I myself and several whom I heard discussing the picture found that our vocabulary was enlarged by comparing the two subtitles. And somewhere it was put in the press release that they were going to be in the Celtic script, not in the new Clara Um So uh, what we have remaining on this is a number of, of reviews in the paper which say, you know, slightly neutral things. So the Evening Herald says the double subtitles are rather distracting, but nevertheless it's a total step to include the Irish word. I would not consider that the use of Irish makes it suitable for or school children. And it's interesting, it comes back and back to that, the link between Irish and education. The, the, the inability to consider Irish as something that one would do for fun, which is something which has definitely changed, which is brilliant. Now, Open City, you can kind of see why, you know, um, this would be a film that might be, you know, primarily marketed to school students with the, you know, the, 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 the hard drug addiction and the lesbianism and the, and the and apparently the, the unwed mother and, and the various things like that. Um, uh, we've got another, sorry, this is, I think, the Dublin Evening Mail. In spite of all its um, flaws, it cannot but be said that some of the deeper sincerity is to be found in the theme of Open City. The subtitles are in both English and Gaelic. Subtitles at all are a bit of a distraction, but double subtitles this year have a most confusing effect. So these are the few, few traces of people who are actually in the cinema watching the film. Um, in Nina, they spent a little longer looking at it. So again, a couple of people in this room are going to have probably close to on these subtitles. We do not know who bore the expense of adding the subtitles, but the public response represented by numbers seeing the film was such that the experiment seems hardly worth repeating, at least not from the viewpoint of renters and cinema owners. Evidently, Nina audiences did not wish to see continental films and take no interest in an experiment to bring Irish to the people by means of the screen. So, and that is in fact what happened. This was the last, this was the first and last time this experiment was done by London Films. Now, what's, I was looking for Irish language sources on this, and presuming that I would find sort of all sorts, and I have found much less than I thought, and it's also been hampered by the fact that my Irish um, search string skills are, are limited. But um, Richard O'Glashna, um, 
a late Irish teacher in St. Patrick's Cathedral uh, Grammar School, um, went to see the film in 1940, end of 1947, beginning of 1948, and he wrote a long letter to Inu, to the weekly uh, newspaper Inu about it, which I'm going to translate on the fly here just because I didn't want to have too many hard words slide. But so he explains that there are subtitles in English. He says, I was happy to see the Irish subtitles. And but the big the biggest problem I have is that they weren't very clear. Me rather slurbalor. But Yakari the Lev the Topi Orinza. So it was they were fast, they were hard to read, um, and because they were less highly visible, less clear than the English subtitles, the English subtitles kept drawing attention more than the Irish subtitles. Um, and then he says, apart from that, I don't have any complaints, except that they were a bit too fast. So again, the timing of the subtitles, these were subtitles done by somebody who clearly didn't, hadn't learned the lessons that were to, already to be learned by the people who'd been doing subtitle work in Britain over the previous 10, 15 years. Um, so he says the, um, the Irish translator does his work well, but I think it would be um, better to have shorter subtitles Mm -hmm. and um, they, they have to be short if they're to actually be able to. So, you know, and it's not because this is exactly the same thing, you know, I'm teaching this to you instead. Um, but the other thing is he suggests using the, um, the standard spelling because it's shorter. And he recognises in the, in the rest of the letter that that's a highly, a highly um, controversial topic. So um, the subtitles were supposed to be by a spirit and father called Andy Egan. Andreas McGaigorn. Uh, he was announced as the translator, but there's only one attribution in the reviews of the translator who was apparently a young Irish journalist called Tom Dunn. And Tom Dunn, the only Tom Dunn I can find who seems to fit the bill, is uh, a man who went on to work um, for, I think, the UN and who was also an interrogator. He was a linguist and an interrogator of Nazi spies in the, in, during the emergency. Um, so he seems to fit the right period and um, the right language profile. But I, you know, we, we, we presume that because somebody mentioned it, his name was on the print, and we presume because they didn't mention it, that Andy Egan's name wasn't on the print, but the spirit and archives of the schools he taught at have been able to produce any information about that. Okay, so just a last touch of thinking about how this translation could be differently presented in different countries. So this is um, a, a, an American production, and this is the ad for the film as it showed in St. Bridget's Cinema in Tupper Curry. And it's very small, but you can see down the bottom it says, the story of a priest hunted by the Nazis, the year's finest religious film. <laughs> so, you know, just to bring in, to bring in the kind of the wider contextual ways in which you need to think about how you can, this is not a linguistic episode, this is not about how is the Italian dialogue rendered in Irish or English sometimes. This is about how was this film represented for different audiences from different places and what role translation practices might have had in that. Okay, so the second, second thing I want to talk about, and I'm aware of time, do I have a little bit longer? Um, is bicycle thieves. So um, obviously, following the late 40s, there was an awful lot happening in terms of Irish language policy and media policy, and um, RTE was set up, and um, there were also, um, there was a, a pamphlet published in 1950 called Films in Irish, which was talking through, um, there was um, Prunchius, yes, um, talking in, in, in um, or Son on Fame, who talks about what, what films might look like in Ireland, and audiovisual translation has a role to play in, in both of those documents. So thinking about how can we be, be using Irish uh, in the cinema again. So article the Rainway, 1966, um, that uh, they would have another go at this film subtitling Australia Lark. And they uh, announced that they were really showing Bicycle Thieves, which had been released in Ireland in 1950. But typically, the continental films got very little traction in the Irish market, and very few people in rural areas would be able to see them. So anybody who wanted to see, uh, you know, they had shown some continental films on RTE, and so people wanted to see them. There was an active interest. Um, and um, so there was a certain amount of excitement around this, this very famous film finally being available on television. And the particular policy decision that was made, that made was that the subtitles should only be Irish. Um, now, um, 
Ethno O'Connell has, has, has talked very, very interestingly about the dynamics of Irish to English subtitling and English to Irish subtitling, and the very problematic, and I mean, she and, and many other scholars, if you forget, if you're present, the problematic nature of always thinking of Irish as the source language, whereas thinking about Irish as the target language is something that O'Connell has advocated. You know, so I think what we're seeing here is maybe an idea that was just before its time. So they, they, they showed the film, and um, it's worth knowing that thinking about what film, what TV sets looked like in 1966, I wasn't there, um, but the data that there is on foreign film, subtitled foreign film showing on, on TV from the 30s to the 60s is that there were lots of technical issues. So um, we start with um, this in the Liberal Theatre. Um, a letter on my desk this morning provides an interesting comment on Thursday's RTE film. This is what it says. Where is it all going to stop? On Thursday night, I made a point not to miss the Julio de film, Bicycle Thieves on RTE. I was absolutely disgusted that this work of art was ruined by Irish subtitles. Are we to sit back and choke with all this Irish being stuffed down our throats by a minority group of half-witted speakers between us who would be better off looking after our crumbling economic structure and many other national problems? And this is not his most strongly worded letter. There is another letter where somebody actually wanted to throw a vase at the screen of the TV, but it didn't because of the value of the vase. And, and there's a lot of data. Another thing that was happening in the time, so first of all, the RTE five pound license fee had come in, and you find some people mentioning this in the letters, and also um, British people in Dublin could access British television, but not people outside the pale. So there was a lot of mention of people switching over, you know, and saying to RTE, do you really want your, li if you want your license fee? Don't do this again. Um, so I just want to give you a sample of some of the different letters. There were 55 over a period of a month, to Irish, and it went on being referenced well into the next year or two. You know, the, 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 it was sort of the, the apogee of crazy language policy um, ideas. So Justin Brannock says, you published, uh, let, let's skip to the bit, um, no reasonable person down on the left-hand side can object to programmes in Irish or English from RTE. The objection might arise legitimately on proportion. No reasonable person can say that so far the Irish speakers have been given a fair proportion. So he's very much in favour. Depending the principle is one thing, there remains the programme. I'm a fluent Irish speaker and found the subtitling too rapid and not consistently legible. The wording was easily understood. Might I appeal to RTE to keep the titles a little longer on screen and make sure they're legible? So let's have a look. Um, yes, so Tom O'Day says, Diplomatically and technically, it's a bad job. Each individual subtitle was whipped away with such haste that not even those who do understand Irish could read it. And he thought it was a bad idea from the get-go anyway. Um, then we've got, sir, I would like to congratulate Helen and Sharon on their honest and intelligent effort to make them more understood by using Irish subtitles on controversial films. More attempts such as this would give us a more truly national service. And this is more Maureen Gillipori again. So having seen <laughs> Rome Open City with Irish subtitles in 1947, she's seen Bicycle Views with Irish subtitles again in 1966. And she's still strongly in favour. Um, and he, but even she, who is like the diehard, has to admit that you couldn't actually follow the subtitles. But the important thing is to keep on with the good work and do more of it. And you'll not be surprised to hear that this was the last that was said on RT for a long time about Irish language subtitles. And we've got Brian O'Hayden. So he says, um, but while I'm going us a go the RTE, we may well get a quail at down the pitch to the So there was both court on Van Eha televised, and there were also this, um, uh, the, the subtitles on bicycle beeps. He says, uh, he was amazed to see the, um, the, the translation into Irish and bicycle beeps. Um, uh, he says, I was going on a walk, Isha, can I go get the Kirk and Keen? I was supposed to go get on a sheet and I got They must do more of it. Rather than what Eragumus needs, um, Eragumus needs more, and what the Horde's doing on Street Nora, a Colin Scan and Valeri. So we just need more time to read the subtitles on the screen. So everybody's agreeing on the technical issues. Um, the, the deaf also weighed in on this. RT's been in operation now for five years, and there's still no regular weekly program for the deaf. Recently, we had the further galling experience of seeing a continental film, Bicycle Thieves, <laughs> subtitled in Irish, a language which none of, none of the deaf, which seems <laughs> I think it's directly, directly contradicted by research, um, yeah, past and present. But and few hearing people understand anyway. That was one then recently. And um, then we had people. There was a lot of snark. There was a lot of people having fun with it. And I, 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 I for the sake of time, I can't read all. But I'll give you one. 
So this is one viewer um, in the uh, Comic Tribune, I think, who says, Mark you, the subtitle would be an Irish. I wonder if this is the beginning of a trend which could end up with Maxwell Smart mouthing this little omission and he's a heating or Trump has crossed into a saloon in the Virginia shouting on a hint of the about and then we might really get a referendum on the restoration of Irish. And this last piece, this is a cartoon that appeared in the um, Dublin Evening Mail, I think, again. So we've got a deep sense of the institution, we've got two peaks looking at the and the kill of the little slogan for those who can't read it says, Don't risk it, you know how people feel about bicycle peaks. So this enters for a while into the, the media consciousness as, as, as a you know, as a remarkable incident. So, let's summarize. The viewers offended by the RTE experiment included viewers who didn't have much Irish and didn't have much time for the Irish language movement, viewers who loved continental films and didn't have much Irish, viewers who lived far from an urban centre, which where such films might be shown, and didn't have much Irish, viewers who were deaf and didn't have much Irish, older viewers who, because they had changed in educational policy and had less instruction in Irish, viewers who had Irish and didn't think much of the quality of language in the subtitles, which does come up here and there, and viewers who didn't follow anyone because the spotting was so bad. So every single person, except what on earth this is very fun and very funny. And secondly, I mean, it's, it's, it speaks to a lot of work that's been done in different fields. So it offers us an enrichment of the history of audiovisual translation in Irish, which extends beyond and before the founding of TVG. It offers us, it enriches our history of the distribution of continental films in Ireland, which, despite Kevin Rocket's brilliant work, has never been looked at kind of specifically in isolation. It definitely beckons somebody to know it's a future project on ABT in Irish in these, you know, middle decades of the 20th century. It questions what the national parameters are of the history of Irish film, because I have found no one. I mean, this stuff is it, in the press databases. It, it is referred to here and there. Although most work on the history of Irish film predates the release of the big press databases, one would still have thought that somebody somewhere would have remembered and would have fed that in to the national narrative. And it's not part of the national narrative. And when I contacted the Irish Film Institute to say, do you have any of this material, they said, not only that, we never heard of it, and it would not fall within our remit, technically, even if we did, because our remit is Irish film, and you're talking about Italian films. Now, I think in practice, of course, if you found this stuff, the IFI would be all over it, like a rash, but, um, the, but the fact that somehow it falls between two stools, initially, maybe something survives of the first version. In RTE, my research has so far not found anybody who admits to knowing anything about it or to having found anything that refers to it. But it, and it also raises some interesting questions about the relationship between the translation industry, translation community in Ireland, now and young, and linguists working in the film industry, and how those two, how those two groups that work together. Um, so on my list, I have a very long list of things that might be out there, including some of the things up here. We have to add the lost bilingual Irish English subtitle version of Open City, and the lost Irish only subtitles for Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Carl. It was an exemplary demonstration of just how much translation studies have to contribute, uh, not just to uh, looking at the practice of translation itself, but also kind of wider issues of uh, national, uh, social, uh, cultural history. Um, it, it was uh, I think quite remarkable in the way it showed all those different kinds of uh, interfaces. Uh, so we have some time for uh, questions. Um, I believe we have uh, Mike. Yeah. 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 By speaking as somebody, unlike probably most people in this room who was alive in the 1960s, and I was a schoolgirl in the 1960s, and I think you put your finger on, this is for a comment and a question, I think you put your finger on the problem by, by talking about the um, the way in which Irish translation is not being, Irish is not being regarded as a target language in translation, so it's only been the opposite. And 
you know, my only memory of content for food, so called, in the 60s when I was a teenager, was we were encouraged to go to a particular cinema in, I don't remember where it was, it's in Bibsborough, was it? Mm -hmm. Where you could go and see German films mm -hmm. or Italian films or French films. No subtitles, but the object of that was pedagogical. It was to learn, okay. it was to practice, to get exposure to some spoken the target language material that we don't normally. I think there's, there's something there as well that, that this speaks very much to the more recent research that's been done on audiovisual translation in Ireland. The shift from, so all of this is happening in a context in which the, the, the official policy is still a revivalism, that Irish will become a living national language widely spoken. And the shift from that to minority language, which is, must be important, you know, which must be at the space in, in, in the media, I think maybe helps to explain why there's a lot of, of anger at Irish in the, in, in, there's a lot more material obviously that I've showed here, um, which I think is much less the case now. I was at the Abbey Theatre a couple of weeks ago and the guy in front of me, you know, was speaking Irish, you know, looking face on. I just, I don't, I mean, I left Ireland in the 90s, so, you know, a lot's changed. I'm very conscious of that and conscious of my ignorance of a lot of fronts. That seemed to me, you know, that, that, that there were, there was a, an enjoyment in Irish and Irish in the media that these experiments show what couldn't be supported at the time. Um, two questions. Uh, number one, is there any kind of feedback on uh, from people who were illiterate? Because, I mean, when you have um, illiterate and who could not speak Kaish, because whenever you have uh, subtitles, as that sort of point to the issue that mm -hmm. you are mm -hmm. able to read and write. Yes. Um, and take the case of speak Irish and who cannot read as they would be sort of token gone. So that's question number one. Question number two, how does all this uh, research and especially the two films that you mentioned focus on the let's say forties to sixties as on a period of not just sort of redesign and redevelopment of the cultural and national identity but sort of a stronger nationalism compared to talk about either of them or both okay so the first um certainly there's a lot sort of talked about the the different needs it tends to be an educational context of thinking about people's oral skills versus their written skills thinking about people's reading skills versus their listening skills so I think that's certainly in the air in thinking about these policies and how they could be put into 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 action. Um, there were some there were some other experiments. The Metro in the States and I think also Rank in the UK does some short films into Irish. They tended to be kind of informative rather than rather than fiction films. Um, so there was dubbing in Irish. It was being tried, um, and there were multiple languages. There were some films made two languages. I think that. It's not so applicable, the issue of literacy, to these films because the audience in Ireland for continental films would have been a very middle class, a fairly niche audience, I think, um, is, is my impression. I mean, you had, first of all, a lot of complaints that there was very little available at all to, to see. Um, and then you've got the Irish Film Society and Liam O'Leary's work and so on. But again, it seems to be a very small group of people who are, you know, who's that with the community for watching those films. So I think. It wouldn't. It wasn't widespread enough to trigger the problem of literacy. Um, the second question. Can you remind me of the second question? Um, development of oh, national yeah. identity and nationalism. Yeah, I think. I mean, I, I think. Yeah, there's a. We see here how difficult it is to fit translation between not between, between Italian and Irish and Italian and English. Because, of course, the other thing is those Irish subtitles for Bicycle Thieves may have been, may well have been done out of an English subtitle script. And there is an English subtitle script in Liam O'Neill's papers um, in the Irish National Library of Ireland. So I think it's very likely, and this was commented on at the time, so English, even if it isn't evident on the screen, it's there in the, in the mix. So I think there's a problem of seeing where all of this fits and of just the, re reconciling the, the inherent strangeness of you know, films in languages, in other languages. And yeah, so so these are bigger, sort of more, I guess, questions. And just to add to that, I think that the 
just one quick question. I mean, the, uh, the bilingual, uh, the bilingual subtitling that you mentioned, which seems to be more curiosity than anything else, seems to have been the ones off, right? I was just wondering if, in your research, you had come across that for other languages, for other for other countries, because what fascinated me about it is that there seems to be immediately a kind of a prioritizing or hierarchy. And in the subtitling, the Irish version is a lot less clear. Sorry. Uh, which means that, you know, that it's sort of really a display <coughs> of, of, of that kind of thing. One so, is better than the other, or, or one is more important than the other. Yeah, I mean, th this is this is really fascinating, and even just a frame, a frame of a single single subtitle would be incredibly interesting to see, because, so obviously, there were, there were already examples of bilingual subtitling in other European countries, and uh, Belgium, I, I presume, was already subtitled bilingual at this time. So where you have two lines for the single language subtitle, you have only one line per language for the two line subtitle. Unless now, and in the 30s, you got up to four lines of subtitles on the screen. They would have half the screen full of text. So th there are a couple of things. Did they have one line per title? Was this one of the reasons why it was very fast to read? Or did they take the print, which I think is more likely, you know, they took the print that um, London films have already produced for the British market, which doesn't. If I haven't been able to find yet, um, and then added optically photographed a further layer of subtitles onto it, which could have meant subtitles went, you know, at least to three lines. Um, it seems odd that they would have done all the work to to um, having already got a subtitle print, they own the rights to they would do a separate subtitle print just to reduce the length of the English titles. So I think maybe in that production from if the British if the British film version was chemically subtitled. And the Irish version was optically subtitled, then that might account for the, for the difference in quality. Sorry, Pat. Um, I remember. Can you hear me? Um, I remember older people talking about an industry of cinema in Grafton Street that only ran Irish language newsreels. So I'm wondering, in the cinema world, was it kind of like literature? Was there a kind of a quarantine or separateness between the two languages as well? Uh, and those people who went into the newsreels, I mean, very ordinary people who just went in and watched those. Do you think they were very cheap? Maybe they were free. I don't know. <laughs> so this is a really interesting question. So in the pamphlet that was produced, the films in like the films in in Ireland. Was in Ireland, I think, um, in, in 1950, of which I've only seen the English language version. They talk explicitly about this. They talk about what you'd have to do on a policy front to get cinemas to book Irish prints. Because what we saw from the um, example that Liam O'Leary gives is that cinemas wouldn't take Irish prints even if they were free. So the policy that's discussed, I think, by um, Maury Oak O'Connell. Yeah, O'Connell, that's it. Precious O'Connell, yes, yeah, sorry. Um, and this other, this other um, pamphlet is. What kind of a, how much would you have to pay cinemas to have a quota where at least 10 minutes of the audience experience in the film programme would need to be in Irish? So the emphasis was on short films. They figured they wouldn't get people to watch full feature length films, but also the, the expense, there wasn't the infrastructure to produce those kinds of films. So the, the ideas that were promoted were films happened in a programme, a main feature, maybe a second feature or, or short films and then advertisements and things. So could you make one of those short films in Irish, and then film cinemas that ran that would get a rebate on their tax or something? So these were ideas. I don't know yet to what extent these were actually, but that was exactly the kind of. I, I suspect that yes, the cinemas that were showing that, that material, there would have been some kind of financial incentive. Hi, hi. Um, uh, I don't speak Irish and um, Italian. My background is Chinese and translation, uh, but I've learned a lot from the talk. Um, it reminds me of what Chinese film, like the um, translation of Chinese films, uh, look like in the 1980s and 1990s. Um, since the Maoist, the post Mao um, times, since 1978, when China do the open um, opening up policy. Um, when I was a child, I remembered uh, the family screen showed. How it had both the uh, English and Chinese subtitles, but um, depends on the audience's intention, and we can choose to switch one of them off. And I remember uh, when I was a kid, 
if I want to learn, if I want to uh, grasp the exact meaning of the uh, Chinese, I will turn the English off. And if I want to learn uh, foreign languages, I will switch the Chinese off. So uh, I think that depends on um, the, the scopus um, um, of the audiences. Uh, this is one thing. And another is, I think um, I fully understand what you talked about in the end, about the dilemma of um, studying Ari uh, Italian films in the Irish um, at film center because in China for transition study scholars it's hard to study uh, foreign films in translation department because film studies center is attached to a Chinese language department so um, I think it's important to break the boundary uh, as a humanities scholar to uh, study both yeah. and that's I mean the, the other thing is there's a salutary point in there about how to interpret the kind of data that you're looking at because the existence of a film with bilingual subtitles doesn't tell us anything about how people are actually interacting with that. And you know, you look you look at that now with something like Netflix. You know, Netflix have all these options, but then they know who actually which modes actually get people to keep watching. So Netflix have, have said that you know they've got subtitled or dubbed version. You can watch it in a subtitled or dubbed version, but people are more likely to actually finish watching the TV show through to the end of the series if they're watching the dub than if they're watching the subtitles. So you know that yeah, these are absolutely life issues. Whatever about the people receiving the film or paying in to go, go to the movies, the origination of Irish texts would normally leave a trace in, in, in systems of grants. And there was government support for the production of books translated into Irish. So, um, was there any sort of entries of the origination of? That's a really good question. I mean, there were a lot, and certainly by the 60s, an awful lot of organisations promoting Irish in sort of various cultural ambits. Um, because the, the, so the, the, the first London films were the were the London films started this idea of bilingual subtitles apparently in good faith that it could catch in the Irish market, which suggests the Irish cinema market was big enough to make it worth doing. Because they had definitely announced Les Enfants de Paradis in mid-1947 as the next film that was coming out by the new subtitles. But because I suspect that a lot of the technical work happened in London, so and I haven't yet fully sort of brought into their archives. I didn't see Dennis Cunningham's diary of coming to Ireland and meeting in the Valera survives. Um, but uh, unfortunately I couldn't find any evidence in it so far of them getting money from the Irish government to do this. But they do do a very sort of, that's, we could say sycophantic, that might be a strong word, but they, they, they do a very kind of Irish is the national. Wide eyed gaze, we would, we would only release this film in Ireland with, with Irish subtitles, you know, which is a basically different area. But it, it, it doesn't seem to have been planned as a one off, it seems to have been planned as a modest experiment. Um, but I, I, I think you have opened up a brand new area of things I haven't looked at yet, so thank you very much. process of translation. Um, are you aware if the Irish translation was a translation of the original Italian or a translation of the translation into English, whereby there may be a, a double whammy of treachery in translation and a more wordy uh, subtype? So, yeah, I mean, the fact that it was done by a Jesuit makes me think, I mean, the people who spoke Italian in Ireland I, I think at the time it would be reasonable to say a considerable number of people who spoke Italian in Ireland learnt it through the church. So it seems to make it more likely that he would have had Italian. Um, but then we don't know if it was him or if it was Tom Dunn who did the translation. And Tom Dunn seems to have at least acquired Italian at some point. But I'm not, I'm not sure. So that first one, it's, it would also be very difficult to have the English subtitles on the screen and have co a competing interpretation in Irish. I mean, it seems like would be some kind of, you know, taking them into account. So English was certain, because they were both there on screen, for sure there was a relationship, but I don't know if the Irish subtitles were produced by somebody who was only referring to the English, or who was referring to both. Um, and the second one, the existence of that subtitle transcript in, in the National Library suggests that perhaps 
those subtitles for RTE were produced to have audio English. And what I haven't done yet is look to that subtitle transcript to see whether it corresponds, what version it might correspond to. Yeah. yeah. So there are big gaps in, in, in knowledge. Okay, um, I think uh, just on behalf of everyone, uh, I'd like to thank Carl for uh, a wonderful uh, start to today's proceedings, a thoughtful and insightful uh, exemplary uh, in, in the depth and the breadth of, of, of research. And I think it's opened up a lot of questions um, that we can pursue uh, to the, uh, the rest uh, of the, the day. Um, so once again, I'd like to thank uh,